Okay, uh, so today what I want to do is talk about a what I think is actually a very, very deep concept that I learned about in a book called The Secret of Our Success by Joseph Henrik. Uh, and I'll put some links to the book down below. And he's actually got a number of very good talks on YouTube, so I'll put a link to a couple of uh, those videos as well. Uh, the concept here is the distinction between dominance and prestige and the role that that distinction plays in culture and cultural evolution. Um, okay, so the, the idea here begins with the insight that human beings have very few hardwired instincts, unlike uh, most of their animals, which are born reasonably well capable of quickly becoming uh, functional. Human beings, as we know, are born um, pretty helpless. And one of the very few instincts that we're able to consistently find that seems to be hardwired um, really as far back as we've been able to look so far, even like one or two months, uh, as far as I know, is uh, a very, very interesting and unique characteristic uh, in humans. And that is that uh, from a very early age, human beings are very hardwired to endeavor to identify who they should pay attention to. And they do it by uh, figuring out or identifying who everybody else is paying attention to. Right? So it's an idea of, of, of social... Uh, attention allocation. Right? So you can imagine a two-month-old, even a two-month-old, will be scanning the environment to identify who in that environment is worth paying attention to, and then will endeavor to emulate whatever they can grasp of what's going on over there, um, particularly, uh, or sorry, to emulate behaviors um, with the expectation or the hope that um, some of those behaviors might in fact be the ones that are why they're the subject of social attention and therefore are worth emulating. And so it's a kind of a crude tool for uh, collectively figuring out what are the right kinds of things to do. But I guess the point is that, so far as we can tell, it seems to be the thing, the key, that enabled uh, Homo sapiens to develop culture. Um, now, there's a whole bunch of stuff we could do on just that, but I, what I want to talk about is the, the, the two different kinds of social hierarchies that emerge in this context. So uh, the first kind of social hierarchy is, is relatively commonly discussed these days and relatively well understood, and that is a dominance hierarchy. Uh, so the idea here, and all social animals have this particular structure, uh, particularly among males, um, where the ability to engage in effective use of physical strength allows uh, a particular male to achieve dominance over other males, and then uh, authority in the social structure sort of cascades down in some sort of hierarchical uh, element. Uh, that's a very coarse brush of the of the concept, but I don't want to spend a whole lot of time there. As I said, it's it's not that hard to grasp these days. Uh, the important part is the the other kind of hierarchy, because um, as far as as we can tell, or at least as far as I know, based upon the information that I've been exposed to, this particular hierarchical approach is unique among humans and is very distinctly associated with the fact that we are a cultural animal. Um, and Henrik calls this the the prestige hierarchy. Um, and so what happens in, this, in the prestige hierarchy is this, this dynamic associated with this hardwired habit, which is those individual members of the group who are most attended to by the other members of the group, um, therefore end up on the top of the prestige hierarchy um, and have a, a social status that is uh, comparable to, not necessarily the same as, but comparable to uh, individuals who are at the top of, of the dominance hierarchy. So humans, uh, as a, a tribal obligate pack animal, have two distinct hierarchies that are happening simultaneously, and a large part of the complexity of our social uh, environment are, is in fact based upon that tension. Uh, that on the one hand, we are at a deep mammalian level attuned to uh, dominance displays and dominance hierarchies and trying to figure out where we live in that picking order. But at the same time, at a human level, we are constantly seeking to find out who we should be paying attention to and who we should be emulating along the prestige hierarchy. Uh, now, now, notice the distinct ways that one goes about uh, navigating these hierarchies and how the hierarchies play out. Uh, so we just use one example, uh, this Henrik's example, and that has to do with the relationship between um, dominant and non-dominant males and high prestige and non-high prestige males in the two hierarchies. So in a, in a dominance hierarchy, uh, non-dominant males really quite distinctly want to go out of, out of their way um, 
making the acquaintance with the dominant male. You don't want to get his attention. You don't want to make eye contact. You avoid it at all costs because that will be perceived as a dominance challenge and then will consequently involve some sort of dominance conflict, which by hypothesis here, you'll lose. Um, now, of course, in that context, there's not a whole lot of learning that can take place, right? It's very difficult to learn from someone if you can't even make eye contact with them, if you're trying to avoid proximity to them. Um, by contrast, in the prestige hierarchy, uh, the whole point is, in fact, uh, connection and communication. Uh, so the, the low prestige males are consistently seeking uh, who they should be attending to, uh, and then endeavoring to find ways to, to cultivate an opportunity to be in the proximity of high prestige males um, so that they can have an opportunity to emulate whatever it is that causes them to be high prestige. Um, so if, you, if, if a particular male happens to be uh, notably good at chipping uh, hand axes, and that is getting him a lot of, of attention, then as a young male, you see that attention, you, you are, are glued to him, and you get nearby him and try to figure out how, to, how to, to absorb this knowledge. And of course, that then enables transfer of knowledge to occur, and then transfer of knowledge enables the development and propagation of culture. Um, but the last part is the most important part, and that is in fact the relationship of the high prestige male to the rest of the uh, prestige hierarchy, because uh, if the high prestige male behaves in the same way that the, high, the dominance male behaves, it'll break down the dynamics. So the high prestige male has to allow, and in fact, um, reciprocally benefit from the lack of conflict and the presence of the other uh, males who are endeavoring to learn or emulate his skills. Uh, so the high prestige male, far from uh, optimizing for and tuning for uh, dominance, uh, optimizes and tunes for teaching. Uh, and for uh, skillfully separating those individual males who, in fact, be to his benefit to interact with um, and to increase his capacity to be successful uh, in mating, resource generation, and just staying alive. Uh, you know, who's good to be on his team? And so what ends up happening is that the, the skill set of the high prestige male is in what we might call um, ethical leadership or in, um, in teaching, uh, which is a far cry from the skill set of, uh, of the dominance male. And of course, I'm, I'm articulating this all in the male framework. Uh, there are various hierarchical relationships in the female framework and then in um, uh, mixed uh, mechanisms as well, for sure. Um, but the, the male hierarchies are a bit easier to grasp uh, as a single example. So, so to recap, uh, human beings seem to be uniquely distinguished um, in evolution from other primates, from other hominins, either from other mammals, in that we have uh, been hardwired in a very deep way um, and singularly for this notion of, of attention, of social attention and of emulation. Um, this is related to, connected to, uh, the emergence of a completely separate social hierarchical framework around prestige. Uh, prestige and dominance run simultaneously in Homo sapiens, and the tension between prestige and dominance is quite significant in understanding the complexity of human social relationships. Um, I guess the last note, since I've done this pretty quickly, um, is to say that if you imagine the kinds of social dynamics that are associated with the effective uh, control of rivalrous resources, you'll notice that uh, dominance is actually a pretty good approach. Um, you know, if, if, if what I want to do is control a watering hole, um, then dominance is, is sort of the approach that I want to take. Whereas if the endeavor is to uh, generate uh, anti-rivalrous resources, then prestige is the right approach to take. Um, and so it, it may be, in fact, that this distinction between rivalrous and anti-rivalrous is directly related, at least it's a proposition that I'd put out there to consider, um, to uh, the distinction between the dominance and the prestige uh, approaches, and that uh, I would go further and propose that it is precisely the uh, selection gradient associated with the ability to grasp and um, advance along the anti-rivalrous frontier that gave rise to the niche of uh, prestige, um, and that uh, we now are in a co-evolutionary dynamic between the prestige gradient, or the prestige um, selection uh, gradient, 
and uh, the anti-rivalrous niche. All right, 10 minutes. That's all. Um, I hope it's useful.